All right, if everyone wants to grab a seat, we'll get things started again. Hopefully that's good. Everyone can hear me. Everyone can hear me okay? No? You can? Yeah. yeah. No. It's a bit hard to hear. These lapel mics don't always work the best. Hello. How about now? Any better? Hands at the back? No? All right. <laughs> How about now? Better? All right. All right. Someone's obviously fucked with that other one. All right. Cool, cool. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming along this evening. Um, ten years. Hard to believe this user group's been running for ten years. Um, Connor, who is somewhere in the audience, hiding in the audience. Somewhere there he is. Put your hand up. Uh, so, Connor, we'll get him up later. He, he was the gentleman who actually started this meetup all the way back in uh, 2012. So uh, we actually missed the 10th anniversary. It was in the middle of this year. Uh, so I came around in 2013. So almost 10 years for me, but not quite. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll talk about that later. You can hear me, but now you get all the feedback. Perfect. I'll try to put it down there. Um, okay, so... DevBox. Just a quick show of hands. Who's heard of Microsoft DevBox? Okay, three, three and a half-ish people. Okay, all right. So, well, at least at least it's going to be a journey of discovery for for most of you this evening. So, Oh, that would be the Microsoft, uh, that would be the Windows Dev Kit. So that's Project Volterra. So that's actually on the, the wall at the back. It's a Windows Windows ARM PC uh, dev kit that you can buy uh, and take home, which is pretty cool. And the, the casing is made from recycled ocean plastic, which is always a good thing. But uh, that's actually different from Microsoft DevBox. Um, but yeah, close. Yeah, it's, it's all about developers. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why why we should care about DevBox and what sort of um, problems it's trying to achieve or trying to solve. Um, now, if you work in, the, in as a developer or you work in the industry um, focused on software development, you probably have some familiarity with some of these sorts of issues. Reflecting back over my career, um, either as a consultant or as an employee in a company um, building software, um, the sorts of challenges I faced were joining a new company. Hey, welcome, Simon. Here's your machine. Um, here's your setup instructions. Install the software, configure this, download this source code, 
um, hit the compile button and hope that it works first time. And if not, go and talk to Rob, who will help you. If I was lucky, I was maybe productive in a day. If I was in a complex environment, I was lucky if I was productive in a week. Um, and I know through talking to people that, you know, sometimes people are never actually productive fully. Um, you know, big, 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 big environments can be multiple months, potentially never fully productive, you know, because you can't actually pull down and run all of the software you need to be able to do your job effectively. Now, if you think about that in an agile environment where you might be moving between development teams on a regular basis, and each of those dev teams might have a different tool chain or a different approach to building the software. Um, think about trying to manage that on a single device. Yes, you can do it, but it takes a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of infrastructure management from your uh, ops team in your business. So um, as you might imagine, Microsoft is a big software development house ourselves. So we do um, software at scale. So you can imagine that we face these sorts of challenges internally ourselves. Uh, as do some of our, our big customers. Um, and DevBox is the result of um, listening to our customers who use our um, Azure Cloud platform, but then also a recognition that our process internally uh, would benefit from something like this. So really what DevBox is designed to do is it's designed to give you an on-demand uh, developer workstation in the cloud uh, that you can pre-configure with whatever tools that you need and which can be spun up on-demand by developers. Now. When I say can be spun up on demand by developers, that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. And that's where we'll end tonight's session is at the tip of the iceberg. And that will probably be the view that most devs and dev teams will have of DevBox. But actually, like any good iceberg, there's more of it under the water than there is on top. So what I want to talk about um, this evening is a bit more of what's under the water, because that probably won't, maybe not that exciting for developers, but it's good to understand what sits behind the scenes so that you can appreciate kind of the mechanics that go on behind the scene to make a service like this uh, work. Um, so it was, um, when Sam was talking about this before, he was talking about it in conjunction with uh, a thing called Azure Deployment Environments. I won't talk about that this evening, but these two services kind of go hand in hand. Has anyone used or heard of um, Azure Dev Test Labs or Azure Dev Test before? Okay, so a few people. So this is... This is, this is, when I saw this, I was like, oh, this is the replacement for Azure Dev Test Labs. And talking to the engineering team, they were kind of like, there are some similarities, but this is really designed, um, you know, for that early stage dev. It's not really the dev test solution, which is being able to spin up an environment with all your um, artifacts in it to allow you to do integration testing and other similar sorts of things. This is really about being able to build software efficiently on a local workstation. Um, and I will talk a little bit about how this is different from something like GitHub Code Spaces. Now, if I say who's heard of GitHub Code Spaces, I'm sure a bunch of hands will go up. All right, expected more, but that's okay. So, but we'll touch on what they are uh, and what the differences are between the two. So let's dig into a little bit more about DevBox uh, and what it's doing. So um, it, it's designed to give you this um, almost ephemeral developer workstation. So if you think about the way you build and deploy containers and containerized workloads today, say a web application where you may have multiple containers that are used to uh, run a, a multi-tier web application. Um, you don't go and change things in production anymore. You go all the way back to the start of the process, you write some code, you check it in, processes happen, pipeline controls. Good job to the person dropping the, the cup on the floor. Um, that's all right, at least it wasn't a mobile phone ringing, that's okay. Um, you go all the way back to the start of that process and you make your code change, you commit it, CI runs, CD builds a container image and then somewhere in the pipeline somewhere that image gets deployed into your, into your cluster. Think of DevBox as changing the way you do development of the image that you use to develop on. So at the moment in that scenario I talked about, I turn up, I get given a physical device. I work on that physical device, I configure that physical device, I install software on it, if I want to change projects, I might install more software on it, or I might leave the company and go somewhere else and I get given a new device. I could be a consultant where I'm working with multiple customers. I may have to have multiple devices, or I may have to have multiple ways to access code in multiple customers such that I don't have bleed between customer details. DevBox is really designed to solve that issue by removing the local devices, the place you go to do that, and giving you a cloud-based um, experience where um, you remote into that box, 
that box is pre-configured with what you have. And if you need to change projects or maybe a different customer, or maybe you're doing a different role on the same project, you can have multiple dev boxes that fulfill each of those requirements. So today, as an example, maybe I'm doing uh, database development as part of the job that I'm doing, but the tools clash with the front end web tools that I'm using, different tool chains. I could probably run them together, but there might be some configuration challenges doing that on a single box. In DevBox, the DevBox world, what I would do is I would create a DevBox for that database uh, editing capability and a DevBox for that front end web capability. I would give my developers the opportunity to spin up multiple copies of those dev boxes on demand so that they can do the job they need to do by switching between those dev boxes. So rather than installing it all physically on a single machine, I've now got an on-demand cloud PC that gives me an ability to run the application software. Apologies for the feedback. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so it does change the way that you build and maintain these things. So often today, who knows what a standard operating image is or a or a SOE or a SOE in an operating environment, SOE. If you work in a corporate environment, it's probably the bane of your life as a developer. Uh, we give you the SOE machine that is designed for a, um, a knowledge worker, has office on it, doesn't have any of the tools you need on it. And when I talk to my IT folks about how I need different configurations and you know different way of doing things to maybe the folks that are just writing Word documents all day long, I kind of get a shrug or it's really difficult to get that um, set up. So DevBox again is designed to, to help solve that problem by removing the local devices, the kind of way to, to achieve that. Um, it is Windows based, before anyone asks. Um, when I asked the question of um, is it only ever going to be Windows based, the answer was we'll have to wait and see. So it's not a, there won't be other options in future, but right now it's, it's Windows based. Uh, but the reason that you would consider this over something like a code space, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on, is because of the flexibility it gives you to install a lot of um, tool chains that don't work in a cloud native containerized world. So if you're doing large scale enterprise software development, maybe you're maintaining applications that have been in production for a decade or more, um, you probably have a tool chain that's not gonna work in a cloud native environment like code spaces. So DevBox would give you the ability to install all of those, install and configure all of those tools locally uh, and then make them available for people to use. So again, for me, that's another great use case for this is maybe I have BAU teams maintaining software. Um, hands up who loves maintaining BAU software. <laughs> no one put their hand up. What's wrong with all you people? <clears throat> who, want, who wants to install 10 year old software on their PC just to maintain a bit of BAU software? Let me see a show of hands for that. Okay, so you could use DevBox for that, for example. You could set up a BAU DevBox that has that legacy tool chain on it, and when you need people to maintain the software, they can log into that DevBox and look at that. They've got all the software they need pre-configured and installed for them, and they haven't had to install any of that stuff locally as well. Offshore team doing that for you, put it onto a DevBox and have the offshore team remote into the DevBox and maintain it that way. So a lot of reasons why you would go down the DevBox route. So let's get into a bit more of what holds DevBox together, and I'll probably hop into the Azure portal in a minute and dig a bit more into this. Um, so the kind of the top level uh, resource type in Azure that um, holds everything to do with DevBox is a thing called a Dev Center. Um, we have to love the Americans for choosing the word center and then spelling it um, in the American way, um, which is always um, fun. But it's a dev center. Um, and if you're familiar with Azure icons, that probably looks like a, an icon you've seen elsewhere. Uh, while the service is in preview, they haven't done all the iconography yet. So um, it's, I think, uh, actually an exchange organization icon. Um, so the dev center is kind of, you go in, you create a dev center, and that's where you start your journey with Microsoft DevBox uh, as a systems administrator. When you create a new DevBox instance, it comes from a, a virtual machine image, which you can create or you can use one of the off-the-shelf ones that we provide. Those images live in a thing called an Azure Compute Gallery. Um, used to be called an Azure Shared Image Gallery, um, but you have to attach a Compute Gallery to the Dev Center in order to be able to use those images uh, as a dev box. You then create a dev box definition, which is a, basically a, a, a hardware configuration for the box that you're going to spin up, CPU, memory, disk, uh, in preview, they're fairly limited in terms of the um, specs that you can choose. 
hopefully over time you'll have a lot more flexibility around the types of um, machines you'll be able to provision. Projects is where it starts to get interesting and this is probably where most people who uh, are developers or dev team managers will probably have anything to do with DevBox because projects is where you start to do things like uh, assigning DevBox um, pools to um, projects so that people can actually go in and spin up those DevBox instances. Um, and that's really, um, for me, the secret sauce here is that um, many organisations will say, well, we're using something like Citrix or Azure Virtual Desktop or um, Cloud PC or Windows 365 and that's our solution. Why would I want to move to this? Well, the, the move to this is the, I can set everything up, I can make sure that I've authorised the right people to do so and then I can give people in the field, my developers, the opportunity to spin these dev boxes up as they need them. I can't do that with Windows 365. I can't do that with Azure Virtual Desktop. And then over, over time, as the service gets built out, you'll also have additional capabilities around uh, customization of images that are going to be run uh, on the dev box, not something that you can do today with either Azure Virtual Desktop um, or Windows 365. So, you know, really giving you that ability to take, you know, what is a generic service and customize it to your use case uh, and in a way that's repeatable and scalable as well, right? Yes, as a developer, I can log into a Windows, um, into a DevBox environment. I can modify it for my needs. But the next time I spin up another one of those DevBox instances from the original machine image, it's not going to have all my customizations in it. It'll have some of them because that will be with my Windows profile. But if I'm making heavy duty changes to that particular instance, next time I spin up a copy of that, it's not going to have it. So, um, you know, in that instance, that comes back to the containerized story I was telling about before. If you're making wholesale changes to the way you do software delivery in a project, what you do is you make those changes and then you roll them back into the image production process. And then you roll that updated image out and people can start a new dev box image and they get all of those updates available to them in that environment. So you think about things like, um, you know, in the Microsoft world, Visual Studio, for example, Maybe you want to do a Visual Studio update from, say, Visual Studio 2015 to Visual Studio 2022. Imagine trying to do that today with, you know, 1,500 developer workstations that are physical PCs. Yes, you can do it. In the DevBox world, what you would do is you would go back to your source image, you would update the Visual Studio copy that's installed on that image, and then you would send around a message to all of your devs to say, okay, well, hey, the new version of this machine image is available, please go into the DevBox portal, which we'll take a look at in a minute, and spin up a new dev workstation and we'll have the Visual Studio 2020 tooling available to you. And developers haven't had to do anything, they haven't had to wait for software updates to occur, they've been productive right up to the point where they've turned off the old cloud PC version and they've spun up the new version with the new DevBox image running on it. So Projects is cool because what you've got uh, in Projects is a couple of roles um, that people can um, pick up, and we'll look at that in a second. Uh, one which is about project administrator, so that can be, say, dev team leads or authorised people that will basically say, the following people in my organisation will be allowed to spin up dev boxes of this type, um, and they don't have to rely on IT admins to do that work for them. They can basically self-service on that. Uh, and then. Um, the next question you have is, well, are these cloud PCs, if they're ephemeral, do they just float on the internet? Are they platform as a service? How do I access control them? How do I give them access to all of my services, either in Azure or on-prem? You do that by connecting a network connection uh, to your, to your uh, dev center and then allowing that to be used uh, in dev box pools um, when they're spun up. So let's just drill down a little bit more. I've used a lot of these words already. Uh, but in an Azure Compute Gallery, um, you build and maintain um, virtual machine images or virtual machine image definitions. Um, so you can use the VM Builder process uh, service that we have in Azure to do that today. Um, or you can use a customized approach if you already build um, SOE images on-prem. Yes, Michael, you have a question. Um, what do you mean by offline and online? So the VM, okay, so that's probably more about the dev box itself. So the VM images always live in a compute gallery. They're effectively, think of them as, they're not really a VHD, they're a combination of a VHD, a virtual hard drive. 
um, and then some metadata around the outside of it. Um, and they're the basis of, think of them as a, a, a PC image. So when you turn it on for the first time, it's like having a new Windows PC available to you with a bunch of pre-installed software on. So it's like that first run experience when most people join a company. Um, the dev box definition has to use one of those blessed image definitions. I can't just go and choose a random one from anywhere. I have to use one from my Azure Compute Gallery. So again, I've got the control over the source of those dev box, images, uh, dev bo dev box definitions having the right um, uh, images available to them. And then what I do is I authorize people to create instances of those dev box definitions by mapping them to a, what's called a dev box pool. Now, dev box pool exists part of a project. Using lots of terms here, I, try, I tried to think about how do I diagramic, diagrammatically represent this because there are a lot of bits to this puzzle and a lot of it's under the water, right, in that, that iceberg analogy. Most people will never see this, but I think it's important to understand how it all hangs together. Um, and then those dev box pools also use a network connection. So the combination of the dev box definition and a network connection will basically allow somebody who is in that project to create a new dev box image in that location with the definition that we've got defined. Lots of moving parts. And we've already had to do a fair bit of work to get here, which is why I wanted to talk about this, right? Because, you know, one, when we say, hey, Microsoft DevBox is available, it's like, that's great, but actually you've now got to do a bit of work to get here. Uh, and for many organizations, it probably is a journey to get, um, you know, to a level of maturity that you're going to have to get to, to to do this. It's a bit different to the way a lot of people would do this today. But actually, I think for the long-term benefits of, you know, software delivery in organizations, this sort of approach is going to become norm. If not with our platform, then as an industry standard. So um, networks went away in this diagram because it just got way too complicated and even I struggled to understand it. So <laughs> um, I talked a bit about this before. So in your projects, um, you have a couple of roles that you can assign um, to Azure Active Directory users. So the Dev Center Dev Box user uh, and the Dev Center Project Admin. So the role names are actually pretty descriptive. They tell you what you, you do. Um, if you are not a Dev Center Dev Box user, in a project, you can't create a dev box. When you go to the dev box portal, it'll just go, uh, you hit the create button and you'll get no options. So you're stopping random people just showing up and creating dev box instances and even dev box instances in a project that they've not been assigned to. So if you think about, you know, um, organizations where you have very rigorous separation of concern, maybe between business units, but maybe they're using shared resources in something like Azure, um, then using projects as your degree of separation really, it, you know, there's no bleed here. If I'm not assigned as a user in one project, I have no way to actually provision a dev box uh, in that project as well. Um, so all the way down the bottom, this is the dev box. So that's the tip of the iceberg there. Um, this authorized dev center dev box user who's been added to the project comes into the dev box portal, which we'll look at in a second and goes, okay, create me a new one of this type, uh, please. And when it's spun up, it will be connected to the virtual network subnet that I've already set up in the connection before. And I have no control over that as a user. When I spin up the box, it shows up and it's connected and I can't change that. So I am, again, um, as an administrator, I'm happy. And then additionally, what I can do, because this is a, a Windows environment, um, I can use a combination of Microsoft Endpoint Manager and Intune to control the configuration of that box and the behavior. Um, the benefit here is that we also give you the ability to do uh, performance management. So what you can do is, um, I'm not talking about performance management for people, I'm talking about performance management for the infrastructure. So, you know, the first thing people see when they see this is go, oh, I'm gonna have a really crappy experience because I'm remoting in from, you know, Timbuktu and my developer is, is you know, developer experience is gonna be awful. Using uh, Intune, we actually get some performance metrics. So what we can start to see is, okay, well, my users from Timbuktu are having a really poor experience. What I should actually do is I should spin up a dev box pool that can be provisioned in the nearest region to Timbuktu, and then they'll have a better experience that way. There's a question down here. Yeah, just, just on the, um, uh, the virtual network, uh, are you able to then define relationships like access to VPNs and other sorts of things, or how does that work? 
of specific services in the organization are available in a particular way and how likely we can get across to them. So if um, I'll try and see if I can paraphrase the question, see if I understand it. So um, when I create my dev box that's connected to a virtual network, I want to make sure that um, if I'm on that dev box and I need to connect to another service, uh, let's say I have a VPN installed on that dev box, that that VPN adheres to whatever my corporate policy is for VPNs. The answer is yes. Because it's, it's just a cloud PC at the end of the day. It's a customized, um, self-provisioned cloud PC. But whatever you can do for a Windows machine physically or virtually, you can do for a dev box. Okay, so the, the, the VNet configuration here is really about determining uh, what region the dev box will get spun up in and making sure that it's connected to your network so you can apply things like networking policy to it. So if you have corporate VPN software that you would typically install on a, on a Windows desktop, you can do that here. Now my question to you would be, if that VPN software is designed to allow you to remote into a private network, is that private network already connected to your infrastructure in Azure via uh, an express route connection? Because if it is, you maybe don't need a VPN connection here because you're already on that network. Does that make sense? So this is the thing, you know, think about this as being a remote desktop that someone is RDPing into because they are effectively doing that. They're already connected to whatever virtual network infrastructure you have set up in Azure. And it could be that, you know, you put this in a separate dev environment VNet, and then you do like a peering connection to another environment to allow those sorts of connections to occur. That's kind of down in the weeds of network, network definition at that point. Um, not too many more slides, because um, we're not really here to talk about slides, uh, even though I have. But I think, you know, there's three kind of key roles. There's your IT dev infra teams. So they're taking care of all of this fun stuff. Then your dev teams, team leads, are really setting up, you know, what dev box definition do you want to give to your, your developers on your team? And then finally, you know, uh, where the rubber hits the road, where, you know, where I love to play is down here as a dev and I can, you know, spin up dev boxes that I've been given access to. Um, so that's probably from a, a, um, a persona perspective, the way you would look at it. And each of those things I talked at, I talked about, is kind of covered here. So what I'm going to do is actually have a few slides, but I'm just going to flick quickly through these. Um, I might just hop straight into the Azure portal. That's probably going to be easier to see. Um, it's probably worth talking a little bit about. Um, so while it's in preview, there is some free, um, free usage every month um, for certain uh, dev box SKUs. Uh, so that's a combination of CPU and memory, uh, and then a certain amount of um, free usage for storage as well. So at the moment, you only have, as I said, a couple of choices. So I think it's a four CPU and 16 gigs, or eight CPU and 32. And then you've got three uh, disk storage types that are all SSD back. So it's designed to be performant. Um, you can't go in and shoot yourself by choosing a, a really slow non-SSD based uh, storage um, solution because uh, you know developers will complain as soon as it takes too long to compile something locally. Uh, but the way that the 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 charge occurs um, is you're going to be paying storage for the whole time that the box is in create is, has been created because you're reserving space for the image for the machine to be stored in Azure. Uh, but once you're only paying for compute for the time that the machine is in use. So the goal um, for DevBox is eventually that you'll have um, smart hibernation as well. So when I disconnect, yes? Sorry, a bit, bit quiet. Is there any indicative price for this? Like, is it converted to as in a VM versus DevOps? What feels like the price? Oh, so, so the question is, if I, if I, if I heard it correctly, because I'm a bit deaf, um, <laughs> is uh, the pricing of DevBox versus, say, running a virtual machine in Azure? Yeah. Um, good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. It would obviously depend on the size of the virtual machine that you're running. Um, that's usually the starting point for a lot of these discussions. It's a bit like the I could run things better on the PC in my 
data center than Azure could run it for me. Um, but there's a lot of hidden complexity in that statement. So virtual machines, you could absolutely run a virtual machine um, probably competitively with this, but what you miss is all the other stuff around the outside of it. Okay, so I'm dodging the question because I would have to sit down and do the maths to figure it out. Because when you run a VM, you're doing this, okay? And you're running a single VM that you maintain yourself, that you install and you configure. Yes, you could have an image that people build. So that's, when you're, do, when you're talking about that, you're almost down at the Azure virtual desktop level, okay? What you're missing is you're missing all of this. So is there a cost associated with all of this? Absolutely there is. So there is a premium attached to that versus running it on a virtual machine. Um, there is a likelihood in a small environment that running virtual machines may be more cost effective. However, uh, when you start talking about hundreds of developers or thousands of developers and you know tens of business units, running, running individual virtual machines is not really an option for those folks. We've all, we've all been there. I've spun up virtual machines to do something and then, and then turned it off. Uh, but the reality is, and Michael mentioned the magic C word, which is um, more than four letters, it's compliance. Um, trying to, to run individual VMs in a compliant fashion, just forget it. This is, this is going to give you compliance probably more than you really care for, to be honest. But yeah, it's a good question. Yes, Connor. Is there any data loss protection? Uh, so DLP? Yeah. Um, well, it's running on top of Windows 365. So whatever, you, whatever policies you configure uh, in Intune and Endpoint Management. So uh, where are we here? So you can see here we've got keep sensitive workloads secure and compliant. So as long as you're deploying the right policy in your organization to manage your Windows environment, then you can meet, meet those requirements. Out of the box, it'll do whatever the default policy is for Windows. If you're not running uh, Intune and Endpoint Management today, to manage the compliance of your workstations, uh, you're not going to get any benefit out of running this service in that capacity. You would have to sit down and spend time thinking about it. So it's a good, it's a good question. So yes, it's possible. And actually, if you want to run DevBox, you need to be properly licensed for all of these services. So it's one of the things they're working through um, during the public preview is how to make this easier to consume for people who maybe aren't doing things like endpoint management and Intune in their organizations today, which would be a fair few people, particularly on the smaller end of the spectrum. You know, it's, it's small, small, medium businesses are probably not running in tune and, and endpoint management, but then they may not necessarily need DevBox either. But so a good question. Um, so we talked about pricing. Um, one more slide and then I'll get into a, a demo. Um, so it's not an either or, it can be an and. Uh, and I kind of touched on this uh, earlier, is if you've got something that's not really a cloud native workload, so that is it can be built, say, using Visual Studio Code, um, then you're probably not going to have much luck with code spaces. So um, DevBox, you can do things like attach USB devices. So if you're doing device-based development, uh, you can use USB redirection from um, the um, DevBox to a physical local device down on your machine. Um, if you're doing Android development, for example, you can run the Android emulator inside of a dev box. You can't run the Android emulator on a code space. Um, does a company need to choose one over the other? No, they can use both, depending on the situation that people are working in. So um, if you use, say, dev containers, which is the, the core technology that sits behind code spaces, uh, you can run dev containers uh, on DevBox, okay, because it's just using a, a Docker container um, to virtualize stuff. So um, DevBox gives you access to virtualization, which gives you access to Docker, which means you can run dev containers on that box as well. So again, it's not an either or. It's a bit mind bending. Um, and if you're not familiar with code spaces um, or, or container based development, that might be a bit hard to grok. But, um, yeah, the first thing most people see when they see this is like, didn't you talk about code spaces just last year or the year before with GitHub? And why are you launching this? Well, GitHub doesn't solve all development life cycles. It's really for, you know, that cloud native, modern leaning development 
um, you know, maybe some of the more static web apps type stuff. Whereas Code Spaces, um, sorry, DevBox gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of where you pull your source code from, what type of application you're building, where you're going to push your source code to, uh, when people are going to access that content from. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so let's stop talking about slides. Did someone chuck a hand up there? Did I miss? No? Was that just to make it stop, please, so I can go home? Um, all right. So let's start at the top of the iceberg. So this is uh, DevBox. Um, ignore the fact that it says expired on the end. That's probably just because my session's timed out. Um, but you don't go to the Azure portal to use this. Um, I think in, in the longer term, uh, you'll have the ability to white label this as well. So it'll be your employer's DevBox environment. So you can put your nice little logo on top. So if you're doing multiple uh, customer engagements potentially as a, as a consultant uh, or as a service provider, um, you'll be able to know that you're in the right place. Um, but this is Azure Active Directory back, so I'm just going to hit the sign in button here. It'll sign me back in. Uh, let's see which screen this opens on, and I better open on the wrong one. No, good. Didn't. So to run the demo for this internally, what we have is we actually, uh, and that's probably a good tip that I'll give uh, at this moment. If you want to try this out, um, what you can do is uh, if you have access to an MSDN subscription uh, and you have access to the E5 tenant, um, you can actually use that um, to try this out. So you combine the MSDN Azure subscription and the MSDN um, E5 subscription that you get given access to and you combine those two together and then you can actually try this out. That's what I'm doing here. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you are using uh, Intune to manage Windows desktop policies uh, at a corporate level um, and you want to try and use this with your corporate Azure Active Directory, you may run into uh, issues with compliance where you'll be blocked from creating uh, new cloud PC instances uh, by policy, which is what we have at Microsoft uh, as a general rule. So, um, so I've logged into uh, my DevBox portal. Uh, I'm logged in as Alex Wilbur, uh, who is my uh, alter ego. So if you see him around the place, say hi to him. Um, I've got three DevBoxes uh, already. Hopefully you can see that. I'll just zoom in a bit maybe. So I've got um, VS 2022, M365 and a Java box. Um, I'm guessing you can figure out what that last one is. Um, you can see this Whistler. Um, that's my um, project. So again, if I'm in multiple projects, I can know what dev box my project is, uh, sorry, what uh, project my dev box is associated with. Um, and this is the one place I come to, to access that. Um, assuming I've been added to a dev box project uh, as a developer, um, I do get an invite email. I don't have a sample to show that to you if it's the first time you've done it, but um, you get an invite de uh, email with a link to the uh, DevBox portal that you've got here. Um, but I can create a new um, DevBox. Uh, let's just zoom in on that. So add a DevBox. My project is Whistler. I don't get to choose that because it's the only project I'm in at the moment. Um, and then I can choose um, what definition I want to use. And you'll see that it has the region as well. So at the moment, I'm just using Australia East, but if I wanted to spin up a dev box in another region, um, I would have that flexibility as well. Um, so we can choose that. And if we zoom back out on that, um, you'll see it can take 30 to 90 minutes. The team's working on bringing those numbers down, but there's a lot of mechanics that happen behind the scene to set up uh, these boxes as they spin up. So they get registered into Intune and policy is applied to them um, and what have you. But um, I look at that and people go, 30 to 90 minutes, it's an hour and a half. Last time you had to build a dev box in your environment, did you get a new dev box in an hour and a half? So Michael, you're starting a new project tomorrow. Completely different tool chain to the one that you're working with today. You'll need to be ready in 90 minutes. 
So look, 90 minutes is not great. I look at 30 to 90 minutes and I go, I'd want to be more 30 minutes than 90 minutes. But then I also think about what the alternative is. The alternative is... I, I, I took four weeks. Yeah, four weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, it may take you four weeks to get to a point where you're productive with this as well initially, but once you're over that, once you're over that hump, So there's, yeah, so I look at that and I go, okay, that's not great. Uh, none of these are running, so let's go ahead and start one. So do, 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 let's start this one. It's going to take a little while to start. Actually, let's start this one as well. Uh, so while they're starting, they won't take long to start up, but while they're starting, let me change uh, to one of my other alter egos. Don't need to see PowerPoint again. Everyone's tired of PowerPoint. Everyone's favorite Azure portal. So let's have a little bit of a look. Um, let's have a look at resource groups to start off with. So there's not a lot in this subscription. Um, you'll see that I've got a couple of, couple of resource groups down here. These get spun up um, for me by the... Um, when I set up network connections, um, and what you'll see is that they basically have uh, all of the DevBox NICs in them. So if I zoom back out on that. So when I create DevBoxes, the network interfaces, and this is the only view I get of those DevBoxes in Azure. All I see is the network interface because it's the connection point from my uh, Windows 365 DevBox instance into my Azure virtual network. So, um, Every time I create a dev box um, with this network connection, the network interface for that dev box will appear uh, in here. So if I went and deleted one of those, hilarity would ensue with whatever dev box uh, is connected to it. Uh, and before tonight, I actually spun up another connection, but there'll be nothing in here because there's no dev boxes provisioned in here. Um, in this one, um, we've got our standard uh, virtual networks. So again, in your environment, you would probably have existing virtual network infrastructure. For the purpose of my demo, I've created a couple of virtual networks, uh, one based here in Australia and one in US West 3, uh, which I'll be using for other demos. But these are just standard uh, VNets. And if we have a look, all I did was I just um, put, I put uh, an extra subnet in, which is the one that I chose to connect my dev boxes to. And then the core group, uh, and this one's pretty busy. Let's just collapse these so they're a bit easier to see. So I've got a couple of VM image versions. Um, so I've got my uh, dev box base. So that was the first Visual Studio 2022 instance that I spun up. Um, and then I have a Java dev image, um, which is the Java box that I spun up. So these are the baseline images that the instances are created from. Um, I have... Uh, Let's just zoom out on that. I have a dev box definition, so let's zoom in on that and see what that looks like. Um, do, 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 where are we? Probably not worth looking at it from there. We'll look at it from the, the dev center in a second. Okay. Um, that's actually the underlying image that gets used um, for my custom machine. Um, this is the actual dev pool itself. So the icons at the moment are still just standard Azure icons. Uh, our network connections, so these are the representation of those resource groups that I showed you uh, where this one's got the three network interface cards for the um, machines in. I have a managed uh, Azure managed identity, which is used uh, to provision the instances. So um, it's the connection between Dev Center and the uh, Azure Compute Gallery. Um, so it's all, it allows the um, Dev Center to actually provision um, the images in the Compute Gallery. Um, what do I have here? Um, so there's my, my gallery. I won't dig into that. There's my Dev Center. So let's hop into the Dev Center a little bit. So if we look on the left nav here in the dev center, we can see those things we were talking about before. We've got networking, compute galleries, and dev box definitions. Um, we have some other stuff in here to add to the Azure uh, deployment environments, which I'm not going to talk about tonight. Uh, and then we have projects. 
So let's just go and have a look uh, at what's in networking in this environment. So those, are those two connections that we had before. Now, what happens when you set up connections is um, the way that the dev box environment works is it actually goes off um, and it validates a whole bunch of um, policies around the network. So again, um, you'll see here that it's, it's checking to make sure that you have certain settings in your Azure AD, that you've got the right settings for uh, your virtual network. Um, it's looking at Intune to make sure that you're allowed to spin up Windows Windows instances based on the Intune policy, um, that you've got the IP address set up correctly, that you're allowed to connect using UDP. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to stop you having the problem of setting up a network connection and then someone's, someone's spinning up a dev box that can't actually connect to anything or that they can't connect to. So you're, you're avoiding those problems up front. Uh, and then endpoint connectivity um, is actually being able to talk to Microsoft Endpoint Manager. Um, and that, that happens for each of the networks that you set up. So you can see here I've got the two set up, so it actually goes off and validates that. So if you think about, this would be a way to stop even someone um, in your IT ops team misconfiguring a, a network connection um, uh, in a region that you don't want people to be able to spin up dev boxes in because that, that status checking would, wouldn't pass and the status would be failed and you wouldn't be able to use it to create dev boxes with. Um, so it's a bit complicated, but it's designed so that by the time you get to a dev box being deployed, you know that it's in a trusted location with a trusted configuration uh, for a trusted user, uh, which is what I think a lot of organizations want. Let's have a look at dev box definitions quickly. <coughs> so we've got three, uh, three um, definitions. So we've got a standard one, which was the M365 um, dev box. So that's uh, this one here in the middle, it's just using a standard gallery image, um, which has just got Microsoft 365 pre-configured. Um, the custom one is used for our Visual Studio 2022 install, so it's got some customizations in it, and then the Java developer one is a custom Java image that I've built. Uh, again, everything's validated before you're able to go ahead and deploy it. Um, you're pre-configured to the, the compute size that you can use to deploy it. Too. So again, you can't have someone say, I'm going to deploy uh, a Java dev box with like one CPU and two gigs of memory and then complain because nothing compiles and it's really slow. So again, you're making sure that people are going to be productive from the get go uh, when they spin up um, dev boxes. Uh, let's have a look at projects. So Project Whistler, anyone get the reference to Project Whistler? No, okay, I'm too old. So it was one of the, it was the code name I think Microsoft used for, I wanna say Windows 98 or Windows XP. Uh, anyway, enough of my sad, sad technical life. Um, let's have a look at project and see what it contains. Um, so it's a definition, it contains environment types. We're not gonna look at this. That's all right. Hello. Hello. Yeah, see if that prompts you to mute your All right. Hands. Okay. Hopefully that'll stop the feedback. Apologies. Um, so I don't have any environments configured, but that's fine. What we actually want to have a look is we want to have a look at DevBox pools. So again, um, this is now taking the the DevBox definition, which we were just looking at, and it's combining it with a network connection. Okay, and then what I can actually do is I can, this is where the users can actually provision these dev boxes uh, in. Um, and this is where we apply um, user access control for developers as well. Okay, so let's have a quick look at access control for this. Uh, and then we'll have a look at do, 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 do role assignments. So you'll see here that Alex Wilbur Alex Wilbur is assigned as a Dev Center DevBox user, and Adele Vance is a Dev Center project admin. So, because Wilbur is uh, a Dev Center DevBox user, he can go away and actually provision these Dev boxes. Um, if he wasn't listed here, the experience that I was just showing you, he would have he wouldn't have even gotten. I think he would have gotten access denied when he tried to get into this this experience. He would have just said, "You're not assigned to any projects. Um, speak to your administrator." 
So I know there's a lot to this. Uh, hopefully it's making sense. <laughs> Um, so that's projects, and that's pretty much it from a under the under the iceberg standpoint. Let's have a look at the the top end developer experience. And to be honest, um, probably the least interesting bit because it's just an RDP connection into a desktop, right? We've all done that before, but it's how you get here. And I think the opportunity to change the way we do development longer term uh, and remove a lot of that friction um, that we get um, as developers. So let's uh, open um, this VS22. I'm actually going to open it just in a browser. Now, the only downside of using the browser is you don't get all of the goodness with um, things like USB redirection because the browser doesn't have the capability to support that. If you want to do USB redirection, you need to use the rich, uh, the rich client. Uh, what's going on there? That's interesting. I've done Inception. All right. Yes. What's the security around this like RDP straight into this my heart attack? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm I'm logged into the portal as this user, but when I connect into the box, I can deploy things like conditional access policies that will mean that uh, if Wilbur is usually based in Sydney and then tomorrow Wilbur tries to log in from I don't know Vietnam, your conditional access policy would potentially say you need to MFA, you need to second level auth to get into this. So it's not just a 3389 port open on the internet that anyone can connect to. Um, and actually the standard RDP client doesn't work with this. You need to use a special um, uh, Windows virtual desktop client basically to, to get into it. Um, so for whatever reason, it's kicked me to the Windows 365 portal, but that's okay. So let's uh, open in the browser. Hopefully this time it will work. Okay, cool. So here I can choose um, what I'm going to use. Now I can use policy to do things like uh, block sh shared clipboard. So you may want to give uh, remote access to people where you don't want them to copy and paste things from their local machine into the into the remote environment. You can control that via policy uh, and things like microphone um, and printer printer redirection, so people can't print um, wherever they are. Um, so let's just connect while well, that's running. Okay, so I'm having to sign in here. Um, if I was using um, uh, uh, enrolled device in the Azure Active Directory for this, this company. I can use Windows Hello to log in. I can use SSO to log in. So I'm not even prompted to log in. It's already authenticated me because of the device I'm using to connect. Because I'm not doing that in this instance, I have to actually uh, log in. But in, a, in say, the Microsoft environment, uh, for example, um, all it does is it prop, props up the Windows Hello login I just smile at the camera uh, and then I'm automatically given access to the machine. So let's just log Wilbur in here, or Alex, I should say. While that's happening, what we'll do is let's just come and open this in the RDP client. Um, so if people don't have the uh, right software installed, they can download it. Um, for Windows, uh, there are clients for non-Windows desktops as well. Um, so let's open this in the Windows client. <coughs> so it'll take a little while to spin up. And then let's go and have a look and see what happened over here. So here we are in our, our dev environment uh, on our box remote. Um, and I've got access to WSL um, on this box so I can actually do... Um, you know, Linux-based development if I really want to as well. So um, let's open up VS Code. Let's see, I'd like to see if I can... Uh, what's going on? Something beeping at me here. Ah, okay, so it's opened on the other screen. That's a good thing about full-screen virtual desktop is you don't even know that you've connected until you pay attention. So this is my Java dev box, uh, which has got IntelliJ pre-installed on it. and already has a JDK installed on it as well. So if I do, uh, 
So as a developer, I can now work on a Java project in a box if I want to. And when I'm done with it, I can close it. And then I can say, OK, well, now I'm going to work on this funky. Um, actually, I've got Java open there as well. But um, I can work on a funky .NET project in another box. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, that's pretty much a waste of resources because I've literally got you know this massive VM that's just doing this single purpose activity. I've got a you know fairly convoluted example here, but you can probably think in your environment about you know dev teams, business units using different tool chains. You would have a dev box potentially that encompasses the necessary tools for you know that makes it worthwhile to use this approach. But it could be that you know you have a long running process on one box. Now traditionally, you probably would have waited for that long running process to finish uh, and then got on with your job. Now what you could do is you can actually go, okay, well this box is running. A long running job, I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to pick up where I left off with this bit of work. And I'm not impacted by the fact that long running job is still running somewhere else in the ether because I've just got this box on demand, uh, which is really handy. Or it could be that I create, you know, a dev box with this Java build to work on one Java project for the customer. And then I create another Java dev box to work on another Java project for the same customer. But because they're not on the same box, I'm not having to worry about conflicts of, say, Maven libraries, or sorry, um, Java classes, and those sorts of things. So I've really got that nice degree of separation. Yep. And, and you're only paying for the actual time that you've got the box running. You're not paying to have those definitions and everything in that in that selection window. So yeah. So the question was, you're only paying for the the boxes when they're running, and not all the other stuff we talked about. So um, probably the easiest thing to do. Let's just chuck that um, slide back up that had that. That's probably going to be the easiest way to do it. Uh, so you pay storage fee from the moment that you spin up, spin up the developer dev box instance. So when I go into the dev portal as developer and I say, create a new dev box for me, I'm started, I pay storage as soon as that box is um, started. And then I pay that for the duration of the box's existence, whether it's on or off, because I've basically reserved some storage space for the machine image. Um, and then I'm only paying the compute fee for while the box is on. Um, there is some work, as I said, that they're doing so that um, boxes will auto hibernate, auto shut down, so that if a box is left unattended for a while, which we all want to do from time to time, uh, you won't end up with a nasty bill um, for idle idle utilization. I'm not sure that feature is available just yet in preview, but I know that it is it is coming. Um, there is obviously this is from a tip of the iceberg usage scenario. You're obviously playing for storage for the the VM image definition that you have, but you know that would be standard if you're using it as your compute galleries today to manage virtual machine images in your in your Azure environments anyway. But a good question. Having said that, what I'm going to do is, because uh, I'm doing this talk again next week, um, is I do need to shut this down uh, so that I don't bust my allowance. Um, any other questions while well, I've got these boxes up? So this, this one that you're looking at there is actually a Windows 11 virtual desktop running inside of Azure at the moment. So. Um, it's got an IntelliJ on it. So I built this image uh, using a standard Windows 11 uh, gallery image. And then I customized it by adding the necessary bits to it. In fact, I wrote a PowerShell script that means I could rerun that. So I could build a pipeline of images where I just continue to add uh, items to that, that script so that I spin up, spin up the machine, customize it, spin it down, capture the image turn it into a definition, and then I update my dev box definition to use that new version. So that anybody that starts a new dev box based off of that version will get the latest changes that I've made to that dev environment. Yes, question. Yep. Correct. Yeah. So the qu the question was is this is this is different from Azure Dev Test Labs where basically you spun up a resource and you had a selection where you said 
install Visual Studio Code, install Java, install things, and then it would be installed for you on demand. This is more of a, I've pre-built the image that has all the bits that I want on it. And when I spin up a new instance of that, they're already there. Now there is plans to make it more customizable so that you'll have a base image that is gonna be your, basically your gold image that your ops team is gonna build. It's gonna be security scanned, it's gonna be approved, it's gonna be blessed. And then there'll be a process to allow you to do customizations on top of that without having to go right the way back through the pipeline to achieve that. But that's not, it's not available today. Another question. Mm -hmm. For some development. Yep. But during development, I got to know that I need some other software as well. Yep. So during that time, at the same instance, can a developer install those software? Yep. So the question was um, let's say this is my dev box, and after a week, I realized that in as well as IntelliJ, I need, I don't know, some other bit of software on it. Um, can I fix that as a developer? Um, so you have, when you set up these definitions, and I will answer that question, um, when you set up these definitions, you can determine whether when a user spins it up, they're either an administrator or a standard user. Uh, obviously, if they're a standard user, they're gonna have some challenges installing additional software. Um, most corporate policy I've seen usually doesn't give admin rights on boxes, and I would expect that their box may not necessarily be any different to that. So yeah, that, that's a good question. There's no easy answer to that. So at the moment on this box, I can do whatever because I've given myself admin rights. If the installer doesn't require admin rights to be installed, yes, you could do it. Um, the question I would have, and this probably comes back to DevOps practices for me, is um, I want to go right back to the start of the pipeline because I want to make sure that that change is available to as many people as possible. So you might make that change locally on your machine but if you pick up a new version of that image, it won't have your customization on it. So really what you would do at that point is you would say, okay, well, I know that I need this customization to be deployed. Deployed. I would talk to my team lead or whoever is responsible for maintaining these images and say, we really need this tool chain to be available on this image. And then they would run it back through that process. Now, as I said to this gentleman just here, there is plans to not make it so that you have to go and build a machine image to make those customizations available. But I haven't seen the details on how they're planning on implementing that yet, just yet. But I suspect it's to solve that scenario because you know there's a fairly lengthy process to get from installing one bit of software on this machine and then running it all the way back through the pipeline to probably a team of people who are doing a lot of other things as well in their day jobs. But a good question. All right, let me just shut this beastie down. Keep talking, if you've got any questions, just chuck your hand up and I will answer them. So I'm just gonna disconnect from this. And, and let's close that. So I do love the fact that you can connect via um, a browser, disconnect that. Yeah, good, go away. Yeah, leave, good. I'm just gonna stop these. Just so that I don't chew up that. Um, any other questions? Yes. Along the same lines, what you get from uh, it's possible to have a kind of SR VM or actual central So okay, so question was around security, was it of, of the instances? So it really comes back to that, um, you know, endpoint management and using Intune and Endpoint Manager to control the policy of the device. So whatever you can do with your devices today on-prem for Windows, you can do here. So if you want to install uh, endpoint protection, maybe it's Microsoft's, maybe it's a third party. If your policy has that as a requirement, I mean, you would probably build it into the image, but then you might have an endpoint policy that checks to make sure that it's installed and available. Um, if you are doing centralized um, logging and scanning of devices in your environment today, you can absolutely do that um, you know, in this environment as well. It's just, it's a virtualized Windows environment is what it boils down to. So there's not a lot of difference between what you do on-prem today or in Citrix or Azure Virtual Desktop or Windows 365. You can do exactly the same here. And I would argue that that will probably be where a lot of time will go into planning how to roll this out 
because it will um, determine how productive people can be in these environments. It's no different to being on-prem in that regard. You know, from my experience, a lot of the challenges in being productive as a developer on Windows comes down to uh, application of security policy uh, at a corporate level, which nine times out of 10 is, is justified, but it's probably too heavy handed and applied too broadly. So there's not enough, enough um, allowance made for the different user personality or different user personas in this environment. And developers do have a different set of requirements to people who are not building and de developing software. And it might even just be as simple as excluding certain directories on a disk from being virus scanned, because that's hell when you're doing lots of disk IO intensive operations and you've got a virus scanner that's trying to keep up um, with disk IO. It just, it, nine times out of 10, it can't. So, you know, policy, policy setup and management is going to be just as important as thinking about how you want uh, to provide this service to developers in your organization. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So you won't have to sleep it. So um, the goal eventually, uh, if it's not already available, is that when you have an idle time on the machine, it will go into hibernation and you won't pay for the compute at that point. You'll pay for, you'll pay for the storage, but not the compute. I know that work was underway. I don't know where it's at yet. Yes. So the question, the question is, if you've got a lot of tools or you're still installing a lot of customizations into the machine image, um, how is it updated as an end user on, in this instance? So at the moment, you would go back and you would update your base image, and then you would basically say to your, your devs, okay, it's time to create a new version uh, of the dev box. It doesn't automatically just show up as a new version that you use as a user, because you're, you're having to map, um, when you set up your definitions, let's just see if I can find it here. So you see here that I've got my Java dev box, which points at this dev box definition. Okay, so my Java dev box, so this is the actual um, instance I can create when I go in and do add new dev box as a developer. That's what I see. And it uses this def box definition, which is Java developer. Now, if I open that definition, you'll see that that Java dev box definition points at my Java dev image and it points at a specific version. Okay, so I could set it to latest and it should theoretically pick up changes as I go, but I would argue that there's probably risk associated with that because you, you don't know if you've got a large group of developers and you're making a change to a key tool in their environment and you're just going to uh, roll that out without testing, that you may run into issues where people have inconsistencies or incompatibilities uh, for that. So I think, you know, today it's a fairly lengthy process to do that and it is a change very much on what people would be used to in smaller environments. I think if you're in a large enterprise, probably not too different to how you would build and maintain a standard operating environment or a standard operating image. <coughs> but for, for dev developers, yeah, it's maybe a bit of a change. I think the, the secret to unlock a lot of that will be those customization steps you'll be able to introduce uh, once they're available. So you'll have a blessed baseline image that will probably have your core tools and the things that are maybe slow moving in your environment. And then you'll have those scripts that'll be for the more fast moving frequently updating elements in your environment. Yep. Yep, no, it's a good point. Yeah, so, I mean, Sam talked about it, you know, in the Kubernetes world with image cleaner, removing stale images that contain um, vulnerabilities. And there's no different here. You know, but then I would argue that most enterprises um, have a slow-moving standard operating environment image 
for the most part anyway, uh, and probably rely on maybe Windows Update to patch Windows instances. So Windows Update still works in this environment. But not in tooling, so not in Java. We're getting vulnerabilities every month. CVS escorts, we're constantly mm. being pushed down. Mm -hmm. The to the <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a good point, and I I I must admit I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about those specific scenarios. But it's um, yeah, my hope would be that what you would do is you would maybe have um, your Windows image with your IDE, you know, IntelliJ IDE or, or whatever your appropriate dev tool is of choice, and then your JDK would be something that you're putting into that scripting environment. And that it's it's you know updated more frequently. And you, you're right; you don't want to push that all the way back through a very convoluted image build process, because that means it'll get done less often. Which means you're probably working on, you know, JDK releases that have got issues in them. Same for .NET Framework, right? As an example. So it's a good question. I don't have an answer for that today, but um, I can imagine that it's something that we would be acutely aware of, given how big our um, developer base is. Uh, both in the Windows and .NET, and sorry, in the Java and .NET world. Yes, another question. Yeah, and how disruptive is the process of actually doing the image? Is it that there's like a uh, an attached drive or something that the, the, the uh, DevBox user is uh, using? Uh, yep. So it's a good good question. So I haven't tried it. So I, I can't give you first-hand experience of what it would what it would be like, um, but if you're using roaming profiles in Windows, then a lot of the configuration of your tooling um, will be set as you would expect, and then you're not going to be using the hopefully you wouldn't be using the Windows effectively system drive as the only drive in your machine. So you know your uh, work would be cons persistent through upgrades of that that image. Uh, but I haven't tried it. That would be my expectation. Otherwise, you can imagine it would be very disruptive as a developer that now I've got this fresh image that has nothing nothing on it. But it does require appropriate use of things like uh, roaming profiles in Windows to hold you know, application settings and things like that. Any other questions? No? All right. So I'm going to just quickly chuck that last slide back up again and just uh, so uh, thanks a lot everyone for sticking up with my ramblings it's the first time I've gone through it so I probably will make some changes because I can imagine it would be hard to grok these ideas uh, given how many moving pieces there are and how new some of this would be as a process I like QR code will take you to um, uh, a place where you can get uh, access to a lab. Um, it won't give you access to Azure to do it, but it's the instructions if you want to go and try this yourself. <coughs> uh, and then a video from .NET Conf um, where one of the PMs from the team goes through the product itself uh, and the Azure deployment environments uh, as a combination. Um, and if you go and you register there, um, you can sign up for the dev newsletter that Sam was talking about. And there's another little checkbox that says um, something around business um, uh, business contact. Um, if you are interested in Microsoft following up with you about DevBox or other Azure things, if you check that box, you go into a little bit of our backend system where uh, someone from one of our account teams may end up reaching out to you. Um, so we don't spam you, typically. The dev newsletter is pretty cool because I write most of the content, um, or at least I make sure that the content the content is good. I don't write it. I won't claim other people's um, content as my own. Um, and actually, the, the seller stuff is really good as well, because I know sometimes it can be hard to find the right person at Microsoft to talk to. So if you check both those boxes, um, you'll end up in the right place. But that's it. Thanks a lot, folks. Um, don't go anywhere, because we've got prize draw to do still. Um, but thank you. Apologies for the feedback as well. <laughs>